So it got to the point where I wrote a book was fucking the black kind of son. We were going to hang out. I caught them holding hands together on the tour. They were getting close. I knew why I give a fuck, okay? I'm not a double standard type guy. I'm a racist to a point. Yeah. You know, fucking there's But then when it comes to nice people, you know what I mean? We all are that way. Yeah, like when it comes to nice people, you gotta, you can't, you can't say right. I love pro wrestling. There's just something about this glittering world of choreographed combat and over-the-top theatrics which has struck me to my core since I was a small kid. A form of escapism which for me is unmatched in its ability to entertain me in such a way that I may, even if only for a brief hour or two, be transported away to another dimension, filled to the brim with exaggerated characters, balletic action and pantomime drama. When I was relentlessly bullied as a little fat kid, wrestling helped me to escape the day-to-day pressures of the school playground and drift away to this grappling universe where I could ignore my chubby little body and the problems it was causing me and imagine what it would feel like to be one of the hulking goliaths I so enjoyed watching on my television screen. When I left university and was starting my own business with a couple of friends in my early 20s, Pro wrestling allowed me to step away from the countless emails and endless board meetings, removing myself from the stress of trying to make a life for myself and allow me time to indulge in a form of entertainment which had my analytical brain turned off and the primal side of my senses tingling with a visual spectacle on display. As I've grown older, my health has worsened. With it, new stresses have emerged which can sometimes lead me to spiralling around and ever-growing pit of depression. The world can sometimes seem like it is crumbling around us and everyone has been through a tough time over the last two years. So, through that time, pro wrestling has once again allowed me to escape. It allows me to forget the pain and suffering present in so many of our lives. It allows me to forget the regrets and dial back my anxiety, leaving behind the hatred which seems as if it comes from so many different directions these days that it can be hard to think straight. I need this escape, I need this freedom, I need pro wrestling and so do many others. What is escapism? See, from a very young age, we are encouraged to both embrace it and indulge in it. It's fantasy. It's Santa Claus. It's the Easter Bunny. It's the Tooth Fairy. It's a mythical world outside the realms of reality and possibility. It's exciting and it's different. But escapism is a very broad term that blankets a whole bunch of media and activities. It can be absolutely anything. But really, what escapism is, is paradigm shift that makes you look up from your phone, it encapsulates your full attention, it draws you out of yourself, out of your world, and for that moment, the world goes quiet. All of your problems are pushed to the back of your mind, and nothing else matters. Well, that got really intense for a minute there, didn't it? Escapism can be fantastical. It can be epic battles or gritty real-life stories. It can be wizards and unicorns and pixie dust. Or it can be something truly mundane. But it is outside of our everyday usual existence and that in itself can grant sweet relief. Insight into other worlds outside of our own bubble and the noise that usually surrounds us. That's why vlogging and YouTube has become so popular. Because anyone with a camera and a bit of time can create a small cinematic piece.
See, now I know what you're thinking. What the fuck does this have to do with professional wrestling? Well, see, to those who get it, professional wrestling is one of the purest forms of escapism. With film, you're given an hour and a half or so of a story to absorb yourself in. You can become immersed in the plot and attached to characters in ways you never expected. Film is a beautiful thing, but you're often reminded that it's a work of fiction. It's a standalone medium that, once the story is told, once the movie is over, the credits roll and you're reminded that those characters were created by one person and portrayed by another. It snaps you back to reality. Music can provoke past emotions. It can draw memories from the deep recesses of your mind. It can be beautiful or painful. You can get truly lost in music. Hours can pass without you barely even noticing, but the eventuality is, all albums unfortunately end and you are left wanting more. Video games, books, holidays, they all end. But professional wrestling, professional wrestling never ends. It is always there and it's not one dimensional. From live shows to TV shows to podcasts to on demand, you can immerse yourself in any way that you please. Often described as cathartic, wrestling is the only long-term narrative that plays out in real time, in our time, yet it still blurs the lines between fiction and reality. With the death of kayfabe came something really unique and positive. A new link between artists, performers and fans. A reminder that these larger-than-life characters are people too. Affected by the same worldly problems that we all are. Which brings us closer, with more empathy, more understanding and better connected. And it is that connection that is so unique. Because as the viewer grows and changes over time, as do the artists and even promotions they follow, we see these individuals develop and progress. We see careers in their infancy. We see them rise, going from strength to strength. People finding themselves as the viewer does too. It's a journey taken apart, yet together at the same time. Even promotions change. They go from sheds to warehouses to arenas as the family grows larger. It's an art form we can truly get lost in, yet remain connected to the real world at the same time. It truly is magical in that way. The ability to escape in a world of something you love is invaluable in this day and age. We as humans are forced to take on and retain more information on a daily basis than we ever have before. And that can be hard and overwhelming. But pro wrestling for many is sanctuary. It's their safe haven for both fans and performers and everybody in between. And it's that suspension of disbelief with wrestling. There are no do-overs, no second takes. It's pure, it's base, it's live action artistry. These people, these characters, and their injuries. It's more real than it has ever been, both in and out of the ring. At shows, I have seen fans laugh and cheer and lose their minds with excitement. I've seen them overcome with sentiment, crying tears of joy and sadness. These emotions provoked by this mind-bendingly weird and wonderful world of storytelling that is professional wrestling. Now I've heard stories of how wrestling has helped people become best friends. I've heard how it's brought people back from the depths of addiction, loneliness, depression and crippling anxiety. How it's even saved their lives. But for those of us who indulge in this mad world within a world, it doesn't come as much of a surprise because we understand just how powerful of an outlet it is. But to those who might think that wrestling is silly childish and at times it really can be but it can also help people come out of their shell or grant them enough distance from the real world to be able to process and cope with some of life's tragedies these days professional wrestling is all-inclusive it's indiscriminate it's become a whole culture it's a deeply dysfunctional family of individuals from all different walks of life all connected by one shared passion all the while supporting each other, escaping harsh realities, learning, growing and evolving together. I mean, 
How amazing is that? You love to see it. So, when the outside world and its infinite problems rear their ugly heads within pro wrestling, not only can they take us away from our enjoyment and remove us from our chosen form of escapism, but on a much deeper level, they can bring us crashing back to reality to come face to face with the very problems we were trying to briefly avoid in the first place. As a lifelong pro wrestling fan, I love nothing more than sitting down with the WWE Network and searching through their enormous back catalogue of classic matches and events, reliving the joy of my youth and watching moments which I have such fond memories of. I have a passion for searching out obscure and sometimes forgotten wrestling matches and diving deep into the countless hours of entertainment which these instances can afford me. But then it happens. Perhaps a character makes a racist remark towards another wrestler. Other times a performer makes their way to the ring in a tasteless and offensive costume, poking fun at another culture. Sometimes it's a terrible accent, or sometimes something as simple as a poorly thought out joke. These instances, however, are just the tip of a much larger iceberg. The surface level which those who are unconsciously or knowingly racist allow us to see. The same way with so much popular film and television, pro wrestling casts its villain from a pool of people that their country is at war with at the current time. Whether it be the all-American action hero fighting in Asia, is it the stiff upper lip from the British officer defeating the Nazis, is it the ingenious spy taking down the Russians from the inside? The exact same can be said. For the world of pro wrestling. With that comes horrible stereotypes. We've seen the cunning Japanese wrestler, the sneaky, devious. We've seen the tribal warriors from Samoa and even from the deepest parts of Africa. We've seen hillbilly yokels. We've seen posh British royals. And I think we're past that now. Pro wrestling, the same as any form of media that uses these stereotypes, needs to move the fuck on. It's boring. It's done to death. Who cares? Where you're from matters in some ways to some people. It may matter to you personally where you're from and that's great. But don't build a character because someone's Russian. They have to have a Russian flag and a big beaver hat. Pro wrestling has mishandled race and continues to do so to this day. And for me, it's one of the biggest turnoffs. It makes me cringe. Sometimes it even makes me embarrassed to show parts of wrestling to my friends. And as a lifelong wrestling fan, that isn't a good look. But what is racism? This is the most outrageous thing I've ever heard of in my life. Did you by any chance hear this latest thing from Colonel De Beers? No, what's that, Larry? Colonel De Beers, standing at ringside with Lee Marshall, wants another wrestling match. He wants to wrestle you. Yeah. He says that if you win the wrestling match, he will give you $2,500. Yeah. Okay, go on. He says if he wins the wrestling match, he gets to paint you white. You've got to be kidding me. Racism can be defined as organized systems within society that cause avoidable and unfair inequalities in power, resources, capacities, and opportunities across racial or ethnic groups. Racism can manifest through beliefs, stereotypes, prejudices or discrimination. This encompasses everything from open threats and insults to nomina deeply embedded in social systems and structures. Racism can occur at multiple levels, including internalized, the incorporation of racist attitudes, beliefs or ideologies into one's worldview, interpersonal, which are interactions between individuals, and systemic, for example, the racist control of and access to labour, material and symbolic resources within a society. Racism persists as a cause of exclusion, conflict and disadvantage on a global scale, 
and existing data suggests that racism is increasing in many national contexts. Whatever the cause, these racist moments destroy the fun I am having and completely tarnish my love for pro wrestling. Put simply, who cares? I'm just a white man who is moaning about something which, for the most part, doesn't directly affect me. I've never experienced racism towards me or my family in the real world, so why should I care? I care because these moments of racism, although brief, allude to a much wider issue, one rooted in ignorance, bigotry and hatred, which in the modern day has become all-encompassing. Racism is one of the most serious and destructive issues facing us as human beings all around the world. Keep it up, I'm an and in order to overcome our differences and prejudices, we must first understand where they come from, the history of this hatred, and where we can go for a better future. You know, truth be told, I'm not a very big fan of the black people. In this video, I want to look at the effect race relations have on the history of pro wrestling, delving deep into the horrible moments which we can all learn from and hopefully grow because of, and see if together, through open discourse and acceptance, we can begin to make this disgusting side of sports and entertainment truly a thing of the past. Do you look at it as blood money? <clears throat> I do. It's like, it's dirty money. On November 22nd, 2008, a young patriotic warrior debuted out of wrestling school. Powerful, determined, and incredibly athletic, stories quickly circulated of this upstart's dedication and physical acumen. Reportedly working several jobs, including fulfilling the role of nightclub bouncer in order to pay for further wrestling training from industry legends. He'd regularly sleep in his car outside of the training school. The budding athlete shone brightly amongst his peers as he gained a reputation. Signing his first professional contract in 2010, his impact on the roster that he joined was undeniable and instant. Over the following months, he trained six hours a day, making sacrifices that most, including myself, can't begin to comprehend. Focusing on becoming better really started to shine those rough edges and hone his skill set as a performer. Like the icons of wrestling past, this proud countryman come to the ring draped in red, white and blue the national anthem beaming out of the speakers in the arena. Enemies shuddered at the thought of opposing him, and all of those who did dare to quickly regretted their decision after being swiftly dealt with by a mix of raw strength and sublime grappling technique. Nobody could stop him, he was a power to be admired, as he surpassed his peers and moved on to an even bigger show with a multiplied financial contract. His route had no end in sight, smashing his way through several opponents the quality of which he had not yet been tested against. His will was strong, and his body was stronger, as he did everything to make his country proud in victory, and the locker room take notice in their defeat to his hand. Until, one day, a legendary foe appeared to smear his national pride. Russia vs USA, a battle for the ages, the summer heat beamed down, and the crowd bayed in anticipation as these two mega powers collided. A fight for national pride honour and respect. The young man had energy and enthusiasm, but his rival was filled with hatred for his country, a veteran in the ring and a psychological general. The war was fierce and hard fought, but in the end the wily foreign veteran defeated the youthful will of his opposition. You'd be mistaken for thinking that the crowd would be disappointed to see their newest hero defeated after such a long and hard-earned undefeated streak, but they weren't. I forgive you for thinking the fans would be dejected by the veteran defeating the younger prodigy, killing his momentum, undermining all of the hours of grinding, all of the sacrifice, wasted. But the crowd, especially the young children, cheered in the face of this defeat. They praised the foreigner coming back part time and taking the spotlight from such a bright promise. This never happens in wrestling. Why did they react this way? Ah, I see. The person's story I've just spoken about happens to be Rusev. He's Russian, the Bulgarian brute. So, even though everything he's done makes me like him, respect him, 
and appreciate all he has done to be able to perform at such a high level and entertain me every week. Even if I admire his charisma, I'm in awe of his physical prowess, his strength, his speed, his looks, his entrance music, his moveset are all impeccable. Why aren't I supporting this guy again? Oh yeah, he's Russian, right. The differences today are usually matters of degree. We cannot understand and attack our contemporary problems if we are bound by traditional labels and worn out slogans of an earlier era. But the unfortunate fact of the matter is that our rhetoric has not kept pace with the speed of social and economic change. What we need is not labels and cliches, but more basic discussions of the sophisticated and technical questions involved. A statement that holds as true today as it did in 1962 when John F. Kennedy said it on the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States. The Cold War started between the Soviet Union and the USA after the Second World War in 1947. After World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union were the world's strongest nations. They were called the superpowers. The United States and the Soviet Union continued in a nuclear arms race. In 1959, Cuba became a communist country and the Soviets secretly put missiles there. President Kennedy was afraid the Soviet Union would attack the United States. This conflict was called the Cuban Missile Crisis. For six days, nuclear war seemed very possible. Beginning in the late 1950s, space would become another dramatic arena for this competition, as each side sought to prove the superiority of its technology, its military firepower, and by extension, its political economic system. Then, in 1989, the fall of communism happened in Eastern Europe, along with the Berlin Wall. 1991 saw the collapse of the Soviet Union, but most importantly, David Hasselhoff turned up in a piano tie and started singing to the crowds. Thanks, Dave. Although the Cold War ended almost 30 years ago, wrestling still wants to hang on to this trope of the evil European, the cunning and sneaky Russian out to deface the USA and its star-spangled banner. So now we're on the same page as to the background of where the negative energy, the ill feeling, the outright racist approach of some of the wrestling stories that we'll be exploring further. Let's go back to the beginning and have a look at Alexander Rusev, now known as Miro in AEW. Miroslav Barnashev, managed by Lana, another Eastern European stereotype straight out of 1985, played by American C.J. Perry. Accompanied by the Russian national anthem, they proudly waved the Russian flags about, and Lana spoke to how proud they both were to be Russian and to be strong. An absolute beast in and out of the ring with extremely smooth and competent wrestling styles, powerhouse technique and the use of an Olympic style moveset such as the German suplex, old school wrestling takedowns, overpowered submissions and supreme grappling ability. Rusev, now Miro, his goal was to be the absolute best athlete and to assert his dominance over the roster by thrashing all of those who stood in his path. WWE lined up jobber after jobber, developmental talent and even some established stars none of which could conquer the Bulgarian brute. One after another, his good guy adversaries got into the ring, spouting pride in the good old US of A, honour in defending their great country from the invasion of the villainous Rusev, a man who up until that point had done nothing in matches other than be the better wrestler, until... A wild John Cena appears and the Star Spangled Banner draped the young upstart's career and for a while his potential. It's this approach in the modern day which draws the ire of so many wrestling fans. We've seen this story play out numerous times. Hulk Hogan defeating Nikolai Volkov and Boris Sukov. Other all-American stars such as Lex Luger, Sergeant Slaughter, Kurt Angle and Jack Swagger all dominating their foreign adversaries. Are you feeling sports entertained or... Like me, are you tired of this lazy storytelling and want to see a different approach to nationalism and race within wrestling? Another issue that some have with the portrayal of these characters is that they're all rarely, if ever, played in the ring by a wrestler from the same country as their character. Boris Alexiev, aka Santina Morella, is Canadian. Ivan Koloff was Canadian. Nikita Koloff is American. Alex Kozlov is Moldovan, Lana is American, Boris Malenko was American, 
Rusev is Bulgarian, Alex Smirnov is Canadian, Zoldat Ustinov is American, Nikolai Volkov was Croatian, Boris Sukov was American, and you get the idea. This specific point in my opinion is new. The idea that you can't play a different nationality on television as a character in a role for entertainment is bullshit. Did those same detractors have an issue with Chiwetel Ejiofor, a British Nigerian man, playing a New York slave? Do you know that Daenerys Targaryen isn't actually played by a world-conquering medieval dragon empress? Spock isn't portrayed by a gallivanting galactic Vulcan, they aren't even his real ears. You do know that Obi-Wan's actor isn't actually cutting fools heads off with a sword made out of fucking laser beams in the real world, right? Right? I think you can play any role you want, if you respect the cultural identity of the nationality in that role. The problem comes when trying to be seen as Russian makes you act like a stereotypical Russian archetype. There are 144 million people living in Russia right now, do you really think they all wave hammer and sickle flags around, wearing Cossack hats and hating America? Sure, some do. The same way that some people in the UK are eating a big old bag of fish and chips and sipping on their tea right now. But that doesn't mean that every Russian character WWE creates must fit within this archaic mould. A big part of my issue with racism is that oftentimes racists will throw out a blanket which encapsulates an entire race, sometimes millions or even billions of people, all grouped under the same banner. There are four and a half billion people who live in Asia, from Turkey through Pakistan and Thailand, each of the 48 countries which make up a part of this enormous continent have hugely varying histories, religions, beliefs and cultures. But within each country, each person is an individual. For instance, India has nine official religions and many more amongst its widely diverse populace. So why do some people still insist on bundling these people together? The issue occurs in pro wrestling, where the wrestlers often fit into a small number of categories when it comes to their moveset. You may be a lumbering giant, a high flyer or a more technical wrestler depending on your skill, strength and size. But when it comes to race, so often do we see wrestlers from a certain part of the world use stereotypical moves to further indicate that they are in fact non-Americans. Samoans for years were portrayed as island savages, having hard heads. They would use headbutts in their matches and not be affected by attacks to their forehead by their opponents. Samoans almost always use a variant of the Samoan drop suplex as well. Japanese wrestlers of the past oftentimes used chalk or spit to blind their enemies during their matches as well as a Japanese arm drag, despite there being a multitude of wrestlers across Asia who fight in every possible variation which would be shown from their American and European counterparts. Those performers from the Middle East often use a form of camel clutch submission alongside an Arabian press or Arabian face buster, those from Europe must use the European style uppercut and of course the German suplex. Mexicans use the Spanish fly, a Mexican surfboard and are almost entirely high flying masked luchadors. I can understand wanting to represent your culture through your use of their more traditionally associated moves, but in WWE, where most of the roster are restricted to performing the same handful of manoeuvres in every match, this idea quickly becomes played out and only serves to bundle every wrestler from a particular reason together, killing any sense of personality or individuality. There is something which has become less of an issue in recent years in WWE and the wider world of American pro wrestling as rosters have become ever more diverse and the exchange in talent between Europe, the USA and Asia continues to increase. The likes of Cesaro is a great testament to this. As a Swiss athlete, he of course uses the European uppercut, but he has also used almost every other move mentioned in the list above. A true international star whose moveset is hopefully a sign that the wrestling landscape has changed forever. Sorry, no speak English. Since pro wrestling became popular in Japan following World War II, this form of entertainment has gone from stride to stride making his way onto television with Ricky Dozan as the face of the emerging Japanese wrestling scene in 1951. 
to the modern day where some consider New Japan Pro Wrestling to be at the very forefront of sports entertainment around the world. In that time, the likes of Antonio Inoki, Giant Baba, Jushin Thunder Liger, the Great Muta, Mitsuhara Masawa, and Kenta Kobayashi have all had their time in the spotlight, making a name for themselves as performers who stand out for their in-ring ability, personalities, and ability to entertain us wrestling fans. Over the years, many Westerners have been attracted to the hard-hitting, no-nonsense style which has proven to be popular in Japan. With the likes of Hulk Hogan, Bruiser Brody, Stan Hansen, Big Van Vader, Brock Lesnar, AJ Styles, Kenny Omega and Finn Balor, all earning a claim in some of Japan's top promotions, some of them earning a space amongst wrestling's elites after having a Japanese title belt wrapped around their waist. So why, for almost a century, do we not see the same exchange of Japanese talent making waves on the American pro wrestling scene? Why has a company that is so international in its fan base never crowned a Japanese world champion? If we go back to 1979, Bob Backlund faced off against the almighty Antonio Inoki in Takashima, Japan, and lost, making Inoki the then WWF world champion. However, to this day, WWE does not recognise this reign officially and continued with Backlund as the champion as soon as he returned to the US, so we can't really count Inoki as the first Asian world champion. Hakushi has had an excellent career in Japan, but he is best remembered for his time in WWF, where the commentators would pretend that his name, which means the white one, sounded like someone sneezing, and that his appearance of white paint covered in Japanese lettering was taken from a Chinese restaurant's menu. Really disgusting stuff. Tiger Mask, Ultimo Dragon, Tajiri, and Hideo Itami also all failed to leave a lasting mark within WWE, and none ever made their way to the top of the ladder. The language barrier for sure plays a large role. Pro wrestling is all about connecting with the audience, something which simply cannot happen as well in most cases if the performer cannot speak at least a little English. But another major factor in their downfall was a simple, yet in my mind racist one. Most of these characters, and most Japanese wrestlers in general in WWE, simply don't have a character to connect with in the first place. Being Japanese in the eyes of WWE creative is so often their only distinguishing trait. Playing some vaguely Japanese sounding generic music as they walk to the ring with a Japanese flag isn't a character, it's a boring stereotype which you cannot blame any fan for not enjoying. The wrestling behemoth's character was firmly rooted in Japanese culture, his aide and manager Mr. Fuji being the clearest reference to this. Yokozuna, the word itself a reference to the highest rank of sumo in Japan. He would trudge to the ring, surrounded at the time by foreign mysticism, ceremonial clouds of talc, and the jeers of fans in attendance. The enormity of this monster was evident. Before you ever step into the ring opposed to Yokozuna, you knew you were already done for. As he picks you up with one arm to his side, you fly face up into the air. For a brief moment, you are comforted by his softness and his warmth. You drop quickly and are slammed deep into the mat, covered in a heavy ham hock of a man, and out for the 1-2-3. Match this with the fact of his true lineage. Wrestling fans will hear the name Rodney Agatupu Anuai and immediately understand just the heritage of this illustrious Samoan American name. As for those less informed with the deeper roots of wrestling's past, may still recognise names such as Roman Reigns of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Big Dog fame, and Rikishi from Too Cool. But that is by far where the wrestling pedigree stops on this family tree. Rosie, most notably as superhero with the Hurricane, and in the stable three-minute warning. Umaga the Samoan, with his horrific taped thumb spike attack. One of the most acclaimed tag teams in the modern era, twin brothers Jimmy and Jay Uso, are also a key part of the family. They had a lot to learn from Afa and Sika, who played the wild Samoans, 
and were well respected for their ferocity and brutality inside the ring and out. Speaking of brothers, the head of the family historically was Reverend Amituanu Anuai. His brother, High Chief Peter Maivia, had a wrestling son-in-law, Rocky Johnson, whose son is the most famous of the family, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Probably the most famous Japanese character to ever appear on WWE television wasn't even Japanese. Simply a man with Samoan and Hawaiian heritage, dressed up like a sumo wrestler and treated like a monstrous villain. His run as a dominant heel started in 1992. Yokozuna dominated the 1993 Royal Rumble, throwing out Randy Savage last on his way to victory. At WrestleMania 9, Yokozuna faced and defeated Bret to win his first WWF title, but was defeated only moments later by an interrupting Hulk Hogan. Yokozuna would then go on to defeat Hogan and regain back the belt later that year. A prestigious run of form and one which will live long in the memory. However, none of this can hide the fact that Yokozuna was simply a stereotype and one which the WWF used to turn a profit, taking the American audience's preconceptions about Japan and wrapping them up into a £600 bundle, perfect for patriotic American heroes such as Hogan and Lex Luger to do battle with. Shofunaki, Dick Togo and Teo arrived on the scene in WWF in 1998, on the Monday Night Raw following WrestleMania 14. Originally part of the Blue World Order in Japan and ECW, their debuts on Raw saw them briefly named Club Kamikaze, before being rebranded as Kai and Tai, when they were joined by their manager Yamaguchi-san. Shortly after they were joined by Taka Michinoku before Yamaguchi, Togo and Taiyo left the company, leaving behind Funaki and Michinoku to perform as a tag team. Funaki said, We were always thinking about how we could stay in WWE for a long time. We were so small in WWE size-wise, we needed to think how to make ourselves valuable. We thought about what looks good, how to speak better English, all sorts of things. If there was ever a case where characters were simply on screen to be laughed at because they were foreign, Kayantai is it. From their attempted ritualistic removal of Val Venus's penis with a katana and the oh-so-racist We Choppy Your Pee Pee, to their overdubbed promos where they would be speaking in Japanese and Bruce Pritchard would deliver their lines in English through the speaker system, something which could have been used as a clever nod to old kung fu movies from the 70s if those old kung fu movies weren't originally from Hong Kong in China and not Japan. Kai and Tai were short-lived. Of course they were. They were treated like a joke and used as a comedy jobbers, but as soon as this weak comedy routine wore off, they were simply treated as jobbers. How could anyone invest in either Funaki or Michinoku, who were in their own rights fantastic in-ring talents, when WWE gave us nothing to get behind? Michinoku would finish every promo with an out-of-context cry of evil, to which Funaki would reply, indeed. Even when Funaki was rebranded as a martial arts expert and given a traditional gi to wear in matches under the woeful attempt at a joke named Kun Funaki, his success was minimal. So let me ask you, apart from being Japanese, what was their character? In recent years, WWE has made great efforts to try and move past these racial stereotypes and use Japanese wrestlers to their full potential, allowing them to show off what made them stand out in their home country and sometimes even allowing them to speak in Japanese rather than stumble through a poorly written promo in a second language. Asuka said, I have only one experience with racism. It was around the time when COVID-19 started spreading in America. I was at the airport. A woman came towards me. When she noticed me, she covered her mouth with her hand and ran away from me. I was shocked. It never happened before COVID-19. Oh my gosh, I didn't understand. I was shocked. There are many great Asian wrestlers in the world. 
When I was a teenager, I watched pro wrestling on TV. The Japanese wrestlers gave me energy and courage. I want to entertain a lot of people like they did for me. I think it's important to enjoy and share and respect each other's cultures. Asuka has been a revelation since her debut in NXT and moved up to the main roster. Her aggressive in-ring style has led her to the Raw and SmackDown women's titles, victory in the Women's Royal Rumble and a prestigious claim to have been only the third Women's Triple Crown Champion and second Women's Grand Slam Champion in the company's entire history. Asuka comes to the ring adorned in traditional Japanese theatre costumes with masks which in Asian drama productions often symbolise a transition between the real world and another godly pain of existence. Through a use of classic Japanese theatrics, Asuka is letting us know that she sees herself as above her competition and in my opinion, when she pairs that with the ability to rip off her enemies' heads during matches, it is totally justified. Asuka's presentation in WWE is a perfect representation of how the company can be respectful of a performer's race while still allowing her to be her own individual human. As Hikaru Shida was about to be presented with a new AEW women's belt, on the eve of her 377th day as champion, you'd think that it would be a great moment of celebration for women athletes, people of colour in America and pro wrestling fans everywhere. However, ignorance and racism tarnished the segment through an attempt at humour from the Spanish announce team. During the broadcast, AEW Spanish commentator Willie Urbina was supposed to be translating what the Japanese wrestler Shida was saying, instead chose to mock her accent and poke fun at her native Asian tongue. I'll play the clip for you now. As Shida started her promo on the All Elite Wrestling Dynamite show, Willie Urbina was caught speaking incoherently using a stereotypical accent, to which Thunder Rosa, who was sat next to him, responded by telling him to shut up, holy crap. When Urbina continued on with his racist mocking, Rosa commented, I'll throw this pen at you if you don't stop. But he continued. Dasha Cuerte then responded, stop it, you're mean before the brief segment ended. Spanish-speaking fans instantly jumped on Twitter to call out AEW and Willie Urbina for this unacceptable display. AEW reacted by immediately removing him from the company and terminating Urbina's contract, a sign that even if individual racism exists within a company, it should never be accepted and that you are free to think and say whatever you like, however ignorant and disgusting that may be, but always be prepared to face the consequences. Shelton's exceptional math skills are never question. One of the most objectively evil men in all of human history is Hermann Goering, one of the leaders of the Nazis, who said, The people don't want war, but they can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. This is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and for exposing the country to danger, it works the same in every country. By this, he meant that if you can keep your enemies in a perpetual state of fear, you are more easily able to control them to achieve your desired means. By keeping your enemies scared, they can no longer think logically, their morale is severely impacted, and the emotional toll it takes on those who are afraid can be profound. How I relate that all to myself, even though none of this is truly about me, is that the first tattoo I ever saw in my life was a number on my grandfather's arm. He rode horseback towards Nazi panzer tanks and now it's 2020 and we live in a world where the president says that Nazis are very fine people and you can't walk that back and you can't tell me he meant something different. It is said that time heals all wounds. They say that the closer you are to a traumatic event, the more emotional connection you have to it. So when the event is World War II and the Holocaust, 
you can imagine the devastating and lasting effect it had on the minds of people around the world. When Kurt von Poppenheim delivered what he referred to as his iron crossbow finisher, the not-so-hidden meaning behind the character's intentions wouldn't have been lost on anyone. With that in mind, can you imagine how emotionally sensitive the world was to people of German nationality just four years after the end of the war? In 1949, a French-Canadian whose name was Guy La Rose decided to capitalise on that emotional turmoil on his way to becoming one of the most hated and highly paid pro wrestlers of his era. Dressed in a German military helmet and boots and speaking in a thick German accent, wrestling fans could barely contain themselves when they heard Hans Schmidt declare he would win the title and take it back to Germany where it belongs. When Hans Schmidt appeared in a televised interview and declared that Germany has been good to me, alluded to his past in the German military and explained how he saw no place in pro wrestling for any kind of sportsmanship. The television station which hosted the interview received more than 5,000 strongly worded letters of complaint. During the American National Anthem at the beginning of each wrestling show, he would sit down and look bored, often turning his back to the Stars and Stripes flag. Schmidt's words and his allusions to his Nazi past led to fans attempting to stab him at wrestling shows, burning him with cigarettes and destroying his car in the parking lot. He drew so much unbridled rage from fans that a promoter could put any good guy up against Schmidt and be guaranteed to get a raucous reaction, ensuring that audiences would pay time and time again for the chance to see the most hated man in the industry get his comeuppance. By the 1960s, wrestling promoters had gone from creating a character in Hans Schmidt, which only ever hinted at his involvement in the atrocities of the Holocaust, to slapping audiences in the face with Nazi salutes and swastikas. Baron von Raschke would goose step his way around the ring, wearing a red cape with the infamous Nazi logo on it. In Vern Gagne's AWA, the Baron drew calls for riots whenever he would appear and declared that he was ordered to win against the likes of Ricky Steamboat and Dick the Bruiser throughout a historic hill run in the 70s. As Frank Facchetti finished up World War II as a decorated member of America's elite underwater demolition team, a precursor to the Navy SEALs, his loyalty and dedication to the survival of his country was unquestionable. His superb physical conditioning and experience as a boxer meant that not only was he incredibly tough, but also highly skilled at hand-to-hand -hand combat. So, given this pairing, it would make perfect sense for Facchetti to combine all of his past experience and make his way into a pro wrestling ring. A patriotic babyface beloved by fans around America, adored for his service during the war and admired for his sacrifice. But no, Frank Facchetti decided to go in what was possibly the furthest opposite direction imaginable, Goose stepping to the ring in the Iron Cross under the now infamous name of Carl von Hess. He became one of the most hated heels of the 1950s and 60s. When a Philadelphia high school teacher was struggling to make ends meet back in 2016, he decided to take up his lifelong passion and began to moonlight as a local indie wrestler. The 36-year-old Kevin Bean, by all accounts, was a much-beloved staff member at the school where he taught and was known for his kindness and mild manner. However, in an attempt to stand out from the crowd at a local Worldwide Wrestling Alliance show, he took up a new character and became Blitzkrieg the German Juggernaut. As you can see, he didn't go half assed with it either, parading around the ring with an iron cross and a Nazi salute for good measure. As heavy metal music blasts from the speakers, it seems that the juggernaut did not receive the desired reaction. Some fans hated the Nazi character, sure, but also some didn't. 
even going so far as to have signs praising the wrestler and cheering him as he made his entrance. A video of Kevin Bean began to go viral on social media where many were offended by what they had witnessed. One commenter said, Watching the guy do Nazi salutes on his way to the ring while children in the crowd cheer him on like a good guy is terrifying. Another user added, There is nothing entertaining about this and the fact that he didn't get much heat and people cheered him on is just awful. Kevin Bean had attempted to grow his fame within the wrestling world by shocking audiences and giving them something to really hate, but seemingly he received more of a reaction than he was anticipating. As the video continued to spread online, the board members at the school in which he taught got wind of it and released this statement. The Springford Area School District was made aware of a video featuring an employee outside of the school setting, participating in an amateur wrestling event. Once administrators were made aware of the video, they acted immediately to conduct an internal investigation. This led to Juggernaut's character being retired indefinitely, as Bean decided to step away from pro wrestling in order to save his career as a teacher. He was apologetic and sincere the entire time, showing remorse for his actions which drew the ire of so many. Other forms of entertainment have used Nazis as villains since the end of the Second World War. There has seldom been a group of people who were as widely hated and thus everyone could always agree to get behind whoever stood opposed to their vile beliefs. So unanimous is the rightful hatred directed towards anyone over the last 80 years who would throw up a Sikh house salute or wear the infamous swastika that it is easy for audiences to distinguish the clear line between good and evil. In the film Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, Nazis have captured the lead character's father in search of the Holy Grail. Their mere presence on screen is uncomfortable and the entire plot revolves around witnessing our hero take down the most evil of villains. It's black and white with no space for misunderstanding. The Nazis in the film, led by Adolf Hitler himself, have no subtlety and no nuance, no reason to understand their motives nor reconsider their stances. It's a simple tale of black versus white used for sheer primal entertainment and the payoff is a painful set of deaths, some which are shown in such a gruesome fashion as to maximise the enjoyment derived from seeing the downfall of such a universally hated group. In the video game series Wolfenstein, the story revolves around the question of what would happen if the Nazis had won World War II. How would things have played out differently in the future, and what would be the consequences of an Allied defeat? You spend your time playing as an hero who is, who is attempting to defeat these racist, vile antagonists and through hours of gory mutilations, ferocious first person shooting and some seriously cathartic killings, we are allowed to enjoy the feeling of gaining revenge over such a horrific set of people. Again, there is little nuance to this story. You are good, Nazis are bad. Help the people who are on the side of righteousness and honour defeat those who are on the side of hatred. These are just a few examples amongst countless others which use this basic formula of good triumphing over evil as a form of widely accepted entertainment. So, why in the world of pro wrestling, a fictitious place full of all kinds of good and evil characters, do some people still have an issue with the idea of using Nazis in their stories? The differences are subtle yet important. For a huge chunk of pro wrestling's history, fans were led to believe that what they saw in the ring was real, not a scripted, choreographed set of actions which we are all aware is the foundation of the sport today. From the 1910s when real Greco-Roman style combatants started to organise together in order to put on more captivating events, all the way through until the 1970s and early 80s, for most people in the audience, seeing a man goose step to the ring covered in Nazi symbolism was not only watching a man or woman play a character, but seeing someone who did indeed hold these horrid racist beliefs. 
Were wrestling promoters paying real Nazis to fight in their arenas? No, of course not. But the cloak of kayfabe was still well and truly over the fans' eyes. So to them, what was the difference? It's a nuanced situation for sure, and I can see both sides of the argument. However, one time when everyone would agree that Nazis have no place in pro wrestling, especially in the current era, is when those Nazis aren't characters at all, but real people. Back in 2015, Zahara Schreiber had the world at her feet. She was a budding wrestler within WWE's developmental program and in a relationship with grappling superstar Seth Rollins. However, through her good looks and charm, her rotten beliefs reared their ugly head and proved their undoing. During her time as a valet for Solomon Crow, her social media was trawled through by those online who found numerous offensive and disgusting posts which alluded to Schreiber's vile personality. She was racist, homophobic and clearly filled with hatred, with one of her posts featuring a prominent swastika. When approached by news outlets and social media commenters, she doubled down on the reasoning for displaying such a controversial symbol. I said that referring to her saying the swastika symbol deserves to be spat on. It has other meanings also. F off. I'll take interest in anything I want. If you look next to it is a photo of an actress who refused Nazism and was awarded a right to America. I'll put whatever I want on my wall. Get the F over it. I agree with Schreiber that she's allowed to take an interest in anything she wants. She certainly can put anything she likes on display in her house. But getting over it is something which many, including me and her employers at the time, just couldn't do. Shortly after the social post came to light, Shreba was released from her job in WWE as the company explained she had been terminated due to inappropriate and offensive remarks. You may remember Don and Ron Harris as Eight Ball and Skull, two enormous bald men whose careers led them from Smoky Mountain Wrestling through ECW, WCW and the then WWF. What you may not remember is that they have been closely linked with white supremacy organisations through their use of Nazi iconography in pro wrestling. In the early days of Impact Wrestling, when it was still in collaboration with the National Wrestling Alliance as NWA TNA, the Harris brothers would come to the ring wearing an SS logo t-shirt, one which at the time drew much negative attention from fans. On the August the 14th episode of NWA TNA, Total Non-Stop Action, one of our performers wore a shirt to the ring that had an offensive symbol that prompted many of our fans to email us. We were not aware of the incident until we received the response from our fans and we agree with those who say the shirt was offensive. We do not in any way condone such things and have taken steps to make sure something like that doesn't happen again. We apologise to those who were rightfully offended. But it's just a t-shirt, right? That logo isn't always associated with being a Nazi, is it? As the Anti-Defamation League stated, The SS bolts are typically used as a symbol of white supremacy, but there is one context in which this is not necessarily always so. Decades ago, some outlaw biker gangs appropriated several Nazi-related symbols, including the SS bolts, essentially as shock symbols or symbols of rebellion or non-conformity. Thus, SS bolts in the context of the outlaw biker subculture does not necessarily denote actual adherence to white supremacy. However, because there are a number of racists and full-blown white supremacists within the outlaw biker subculture, sometimes it actually is used as a symbol of white supremacy. Often the intended use and meaning of the SS bolts in this context is quite ambiguous and difficult to determine. So maybe it's just a logo representing the Harris brothers' allegiance to a biker gang and to them, when they were younger, they weren't aware what the t-shirts would represent. That makes kind of, I can kind of see that idea. CEO of Arrow Lucha, Jason Brown, who started a company with the Harris brothers, said, 
The Harris Brothers' TV personas and gimmicks were as bikers, but they are about as far from Nazi sympathisers as the East is from the West and were in no way involved in that culture, behaviour or activity. This was much like the wrestler whose character or gimmick was Junkyard Dog. However, he did not work in a junkyard, nor was he part dog, just as the wrestler known as The Undertaker wasn't in the funeral home business. The image you may have seen in Google search were costume and TV personas that Ron and Don played while working for wrestling promotion during their career as wrestlers, including the WWE and TNA. Besides, once they took off those t-shirts, Don and Ron were just a couple of big guys who liked to wrestle and were just playing a character on screen. A logo on a t-shirt worn by a character in a fictional setting doesn't automatically make the person a racist. It has very little bearing on their personal beliefs at all. However, what might be an indicator of if you were a Nazi sympathiser or not, is if you had something permanent, something which, once you stop playing the offensive character and drop the gimmick, doesn't go away. Perhaps a pair of large matching SS tattoos on your biceps. Maybe they just really loved the band Kiss and decided that Ron would get the KI as a tattoo and Don would get the SS part as a tattoo, but they got mixed up, resulting in both of them with the lightning bolt SS. Or perhaps they're just Nazis. You know what, I, I, I look at it as a storyline. It was something that was prevalent and it's still prevalent. There, there'll always be biases, there'll always be prejudice, there'll always be racism. Uh, it's how you deal with it. On a TV show, you can fight people and beat people up for it. In the real world, you have to be able to create policies that change who's in power and change the racism, change the, the prejudice uh, from that standpoint. When Luther Lindsay began his journey in the pro wrestling business in the 1940s, an arena full of white working class grappling fans was not a friendly place for a large black man, especially as segregation was still in full effect. Lindsay, however, never let the negativity interrupt his rise to stardom as he used his expert knowledge of wrestling techniques along with his naturally impressive physique to wow even the most die-hard racists in the crowd. Trained by legendary hard man Stu Hart, it is said that the stoic Canadian always kept a picture of Luther Lindsay in his wallet as an honour to the only man to have ever legitimately submitted him within a wrestling ring. This toughness, alongside his ability to entertain the crowd, saw Lindsay earn the respect of other industry icons such as Lou Thez on his way to having the first interracial wrestling match to occur in the south of the states in the 1950s. By 1972, Luther Lindsay had overcome every bigoted hurdle put in his way and cemented his legacy amongst the wrestling industry's pioneers a point that made one night on February the 21st, 1972, all the more regrettable. During a match with a wrestler by the name of Bobby Paul, Lindsay delivered his classic diving belly flop, and, as he had done so many times throughout his career, held his opponent down for the three count and the victory. However, it was immediately discovered that Lindsay had suffered a powerful and life-ending heart attack during his manoeuvre and died whilst the referee was still counting the pin. Terrible for all involved and a real moment of horror for the participants in the ring. Attempts to resuscitate Lindsay failed and he was pronounced dead where he lay, ending his career with a victory, one which a man such as Luther Lindsay and his many struggles within the industry deserved. Since then, he has been named in multiple Hall of Fames and given more credit for his hard work and dedication to making pro wrestling and the wider world of sports and entertainment a more accepting place for everyone. Virgil's career started way back in 1985 and took off when he became the manservant of Ted DiBiase in a role which had many racial undertones and hasn't aged well in retrospect. However, it was once Virgil had left the mainstream wrestling scene that things started to sour for his career. 
During a show which took place at the National Wrestling Conference, Virgil came to the ring. His fame that he'd built up within WWF followed him, and the fans were delighted with his arrival. His opponent on the night was a wrestler by the name of Thug, whose appearance in a match is as shocking today as it would have been back in the 90s. Dressed in a KKK white hood, the thug made his way to the ring to the booze of the crowd in attendance, as the match commentators stumble through a confused attempt to explain what was happening. The match starts with a man dressed in full white clansman robes and hood, stepping into the ring with Virgil whilst the thug remains outside. As the match quickly dissolves into a brawl, Virgil attacks the man stood opposite him in the ring as the rest of the clan descend. As Virgil is overwhelmed by the two attackers, the hooded figure removes his garb to reveal that it is in fact Jim the Anvil Neidhart, who proceeds to thrash Virgil around the ring. The other member of the clan, still hooded, continually struggles with seeing through his pillowcase hood, and with every punch and kick has to readjust it to prevent it from falling off completely. Jim Neidhart then proceeds to take his now removed robes and tie them around Virgil's neck choking him out and dragging him around the mat, before throwing him over the top ropes and using the robes as a makeshift noose, delivering some painfully unpleasant imagery as Virgil continues to suffocate whilst hanging. Unable to move or defend himself, Virgil's lifeless body is then punched and kicked by Neidhart before the match officials step in to remove the KKK from the building, leaving Virgil unconscious on the floor outside the ring. I'm not sure what anyone involved with this angle was thinking. It's shocking, sure. It draws booze from the crowd. It is fiction after all, but it's also disgusting and quite offensive. In action movies, when racists are used, it is almost entirely as the villains, which, as an audience, we enjoy seeing defeated by the end of the story. But what purpose did this horrific event serve? Virgil lost, utterly broken by his oppressors, made to look stupid for falling to the sneak attack and defeated by the end. There was no comeback or redemption, no body to cheer and nothing to enjoy. Truly a terrible day in the history of pro wrestling. As Lola said on the creation of the character, as soon as I saw Harris, this painting came to mind where this beautiful girl is tied to a stake and these cannibals are about to burn her at the stake. They were doing this crazy war dance around this girl and that came to my mind. I could paint this guy and make him terrific. The Ugandan headhunter proved extremely effective. His enormous £300 frame and charisma brought a terrifying presence to his matches. Eventually, Kamala made his way to the WWF, where he became an even bigger star. Without saying a word, spear in hand and a slap on his belly. The character heavily relied on the ignorance of fans and played into the audience's fears of what they didn't understand. Throughout the 80s, Kamala became one of the biggest names in wrestling, facing off against the likes of Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan on his way to becoming an icon of the era. He made a half million dollars and I made 13 grand. There was a lot of racism in the WWE. I remember so many times when I was there, I would get there early and find me a nice dressing room. The agents would kick me out and let the white stars have the dressing room. When I went out to the ring, I was a superstar. Backstage, I was nothing. This was never more apparent when we look at the case of Jessica Havoc, a bright spark amongst the Impact Wrestling roster who had been offered a tryout with the WWE developmental brand NXT. Something which, in our own words, was a dream come true. However, things quickly turned dark for Havoc when, during the process of the NXT trials, tweets from her years prior came to light and were brought to the attention of the staff inside of WWE, who, rightfully so, cut all contact with the female wrestler. Probably feeling a sense of shame, regret and anger, Jessica quickly set to work, deleting her old tweets, only for them to be saved by others and spread through the online wrestling community. When her attempts to remove the evidence didn't work, she was forced to apologise. 
I want to apologise wholeheartedly for the old tweets that are being brought up right now. Legit, it was years ago and I don't even remember tweeting over half of this stuff. The stuff I do remember was jokes that were in bad taste. I was young and very new to social media promos and I was very immature and just said things to make my friends laugh at the time, inside jokes between us. I don't really feel or believe any of those things. I did actually tweet. I am a loving, compassionate person and I love everyone. No matter who, I would die for any wrestling fan and I care so much about wrestling and everything in it. I would not be here without any of you and I was young, stupid and immature. I am not too proud to admit some of it was me being bitter for all the wrong reasons, but I've learned and grown from this. I hope this can be forgiven. Being racist as an inside joke between friends still makes what you said racist. Being racist as a form of humour still makes you a bit of a scumbag. Jessica would later on change her story. Instead of owning up to her ignorance as she once attempted to do, she tried to distance herself from the racism she had shown and change the narrative of what actually happened when she said, I trended worldwide as a racist that day. What is even more effed up is that the tweets that trended worldwide and got plastered on every dirt sheet website weren't even real. The KFC one especially. That same group of little trolls used a Twitter app to photoshop these tweets and made it huge. I had a team of people look into the group and have screenshots and proofs of them bragging about screwing me over and even saying things like, who do we mess with next? Again, call me a liar and anything else you can think of. I've heard it all at this point, but I have proof, kids. I am even told I can sue. Slander and defamation of character. They cost me my dream job. I may pursue it, who knows. Being racist for any reason is horrible, obviously, but something which we see time and time again on social media is someone who takes pride in the fact that they don't care who they offended. People tell others to stop being so delicate and remind us that it's all just a joke, but it isn't. And when their disgusting beliefs come back to haunt them, suddenly they do care who they offend, and they are the ones who are crying for the public to treat them more gently. Jessica asked for understanding, support and sympathy. But where was her understanding, support and sympathy for other human beings in these tweets and the so-called jokes she shared with friends? Having your dreams ripped away from you just as you're about to realise them has got to be one of the worst feelings imaginable. But when the person is a hateful racist, it's hard to show the type of forgiveness Jessica Havert called for in her apology. Blackface. 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 America is not new to scandals about blackface. Minstrelsy is a performance tradition that started in the mid-1800s. And what it was, it was whites dressing up, caricaturing African Americans, mimicking their dance, their language, their music, providing a comic relief for their audiences. Now look at Hakeem and then look over there and go, you mean to tell me you was him? I'm like, yeah, I was... I was the same person. One man gang was our team, and they're like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. George Gray had already established himself as a dominant figure on the territorial wrestling circuit before his arrival in the WWF in 1987. One man gang was a powerhouse biker who tore through rosters covered in leather and sweat. When he was taken under the wing of manager Slick, a smooth talking pimp, his character changed with it. It was revealed at Survivor Series in 1988 that George Gray wasn't a white motorbike gang member, but in fact a repressed black man whose real name was Akeem the African Dream. Reborn with a black scent and dressed in traditional African hat and colours, Akeem was a poorly thought out stereotype. His loose dance moves, I think, are an attempt at some kind of African American stereotype as well. Originally, Created as a comedic character, it's hard to see what was supposed to be funny. The fact that he's playing a black person, the idea that he's from Africa. I, I never understood it when I was younger and I don't understand it now. Through Akeem's short run in WWE, he teamed with Big Boss Man to face off against the mega powers in Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage at Survivor Series before fading into obscurity. It's hard to see the positives from this one. But WWE seemingly still do, as videos of the character are available on their YouTube channel and network. 
よし。えー<笑>よしよし。いだーじゃなくて、あーうち。うーうーうーうー。うん。Hey, what the fuck? You got a fucking problem? Huh? I'll pound the living shit out of you, you dumbass, freaky tourist. I'm not a racist. When Roddy Piper was set to face Bad News Brown at WrestleMania 6, he decided that in order to make the fans more invested in the event, he would make the hatred in their on-screen rivalry a personal one. He said, I'm looking at Bad News, who was a really good judo player and just a so-so professional wrestler, and here's what's going through my mind. I'm looking at him and I'm going, I'm going to have 45 interviews about this guy. At this time, Cindy Lauper had the song True Colours out. In my mind, what I was trying to do, there's no difference. I needed material on Bad News Brown. I did something where I sang True Colours and I did a thing about Nelson Mandela. When the reaction to Piper's promos fell flat, Vince McMahon decided that the idea of black versus white should be played up in order to increase interest from fans. Bad News Brown said, they told me in the office Piper would be wearing blackface. Vince said, We think that this is a great idea. This is good. What do you think? Unenthusiastically, Bad News Brown said, Yeah, it sounds great, Vince. Well, I'm gearing myself up to go with Piper because I know somewhere down the road, before the week's out, I'm going to wind up kicking his ass. I knew that. Because right. I didn't like his mouth or anything. The guy's a racist and all that. He continued, I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard, but I figured, let him go ahead and do it. One of these times, one of these brothers is going to get all up in him and he's going to be sorry. The reason I painted myself half black was more the meshing. Bad News Brown didn't take it that way at all. Before the match at WrestleMania, Piper came out to address the crowd on primetime wrestling in an interview with Gene Oakland. At this point, he had only half his face painted in a deep shade of black. He said, I'm half black, I'm half white, I'm wearing a dress, aren't I crazy enough to get the job done? Later at the WrestleMania event, a promo ed where Piper stood to one side, showing his profile, that of his natural white skin, and talking to himself. He then turned to reveal the completely black side of his body and began to argue back at himself as if he was possessed. As Piper danced like Michael Jackson to the ring, the match between the pair was the least memorable part of this whole saga. At one point, Piper put on a glove, which Gorilla Monsoon referred to as a Michael Jackson glove, and proceeded to beat Bad News Brown with punches before the pair were counted out for fighting outside of the ring. In the years since, Piper has explained that he is not a racist, and the whole meaning behind the character and black face paint was misunderstood. Bad News Brown continues to see things differently. It objectifies African Americans and distances them from their humanity. It made them seem foolish, simple of mind, not intelligent, cheap. An image and a stereotype that people use as a lens to judge African Americans from here on out. During a feud with Ernest the Cat Miller in July of 1999, Buff Bagwell came out to his opponent's theme music and emulated his iconic dance moves on his way to the ring. The reference would have been obvious on its own, but pro wrestling seemingly always has to be right on the nose, in our faces with explaining what we see from the performers. Thus, Bagwell had his face painted brown and, and danced around in an exaggerated and stereotypical fashion, which, looking back on today, hasn't aged very well. In recent years, Dustin Rhodes has carved out a legacy for himself, known for his longevity in the business and his ability to perform at the highest level, even at his advanced age. In AEW, his character has taken a more serious approach and had faced off against several opponents in classic matchups, including a fondly remembered and emotional feud with his younger brother, Cody. However, this hasn't always been the case. After moving around the wrestling world, Dustin returned to WWF in 1995 with a new character, the villain, the bizarre one, Goldust, an effeminate and unusual character who played on the idea of 
gay panic in the 90s, blowing kisses, groping his male opponents and being sexually suggestive were all a part of Goldust's tactics to unnerve and distract in order to win victory in his matches. In 1997, the androgynous nature of the character led to Goldust emulating both male and female wrestlers and celebrities during his matches. One such time, when Goldust was facing off against Two Cold Scorpio, known at the time as Flash Funk on Raw, Goldust came to the ring dressed as a black man, complete with oversized afro, gold chains and a boombox. As the ring announcer calls the character, the artist formerly known as Gold Dust as a reference to the musical artist Prince, commentator Jerry Lawler says, he looks more like the artist formerly known as Shaft, laughing his head off the whole time. The crowd boo and for good reason, this is about as distasteful a blackface as you can get. There's no attempt from Gold Dust to represent a black person, his skin is unnaturally dark and his hands remain unpainted. It is more akin to the look achieved by minstrels in the 1800s, and that's where, in my opinion, these kind of acts should remain. Seemingly, Peacock, the network that now owns the rights to the WWE back catalogue, agrees. Dave Meltzer said, Peacock and WWE are evidently editing out segments from the late 90s with gold dust wearing black paint on his face. The Nation of Domination were an all-black wrestling stable who used their oppression as fuel to drive them in unity towards victory. During a feud between D-Generation X and the Nation, it was clear that race would play a part of what made up the hatred between the two competing groups. On an episode of Raw in 1998, in order to mock the Nation and their black members, DX donned blackface and stereotypical characteristics during a now infamous televised segment. Each member of DX emulated their counterpart from the nation, Triple H dressed in a tight afro, a large eyebrow and brown makeup in order to become the Croc, a reference to nation member Dwayne Johnson. Billy Gunn also covered himself in brown makeup, a large chain and came to the ring puffing a cigar in order to emulate the Godfather as the Gunfather. We didn't take it that way, it was just us having fun. You look back at it now and you're like, wow, that would never go across today. But then no one was thinking about it being racist. We didn't think that way. We were just having fun. The worst offender in most people's eyes was Sean Walkman, who was tasked with mocking Mark Henry. Amongst the ragtag group of tasteless parodies, X-Pac's Miz Ark rendition, but I mean, I protested. I had people on both sides of that tell me, oh no, it's okay. But this wouldn't be the last time Billy Gunn would be involved in a rather problematic moment where he donned blackface. When he and Road Dogg left WWE, they formed a faction within rival company TNA and quickly entered into a feud with another ex-WWE tag team in the Dudley Boys, once again showing that the two men think imitation is the highest form of flattery, performed a parody of both Bubba and Devon, and yep, you guessed it, one of them had to be Devon, an African-American man. So. Billy Gunn did, with Devon's blessing, and came to the ring for the segment with what is, in my opinion, the most ignorant form of blackface possible. There's no attempt to look like Devon here, just like the Gold Dust version, merely an ignorant and outdated caricature which, knowingly or not, comes from a place of racism. The Fabulous Freebirds were a prolific trio who rose to prominence in the 1980s in AWA. Their carefree and cocky attitudes were backed up by devastating in-ring power and technique which saw the various members of the Freebird faction obtain numerous title belts throughout the group's history. Since their run in the 1980s and 90s, the group has been inducted into the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame as members Hayes, Roberts and Gordy, whilst also being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame with all four members, Garvin, Gordy, Hayes and Roberts, attaining that honour. As Michael Hayes climbs up onto the ring apron, it's hard to ignore his glittering confederate flag, wrapped over his shoulders as a cape, beaming strobes of light around the crowd. It makes me feel a little uncomfortable, and as a non-American, I wasn't clued up on the history surrounding the symbol, 
and didn't want to pass judgement on the confederate flag without knowing some of the details. So, I went down an incredibly interesting and somewhat traumatic wormhole, watching documentaries and reading information online. To be honest, I was pretty shocked with what I found. The confederate flag was only the start. The following are direct quotes as I didn't want to pass judgement and be biased, so I've laid them out for you as I found them. Although the Confederate States of America dissolved in 1865, its battle flag has continued to receive modern display. The modern display began during the 1948 United States presidential election when it was used by the Dixiecrats, a political party that opposed civil rights to African Americans and supported racial segregation. Further display of the flag was a response to the civil rights movement and the passage of federal civil laws in the 50s and 60s. The display of flags associated with the confederacy is controversial. The confederate battle flag is associated with pride in southern heritage, states rights, historical commemoration of the American Civil War, glorification of the Civil War and celebrating the myth of the lost cause, racism, slavery, segregation and white supremacy. In a 2001 essay, Old Times, They Are Best Forgotten, Emory University professor Lucas Carpenter observed that contemporary confederate sympathisers want free use of the confederate symbolism because they say it represents their heritage. It does, of course, but it is heritage chiefly characterised by its brutal oppression of slaves and their free descendants. The most important thing to know about the south is that until recently it was a region ruled by slavery and apartheid. The confederate flag is a controversial symbol for many Americans today. A 2011 Pew Research Center poll revealed that 30% of Americans had a negative reaction when they saw the confederate flag displayed. According to the same poll, 9% of Americans had a positive reaction and a majority had no reaction. Among black Americans, 41% had a negative reaction, 10 a positive and 45 had none. In a national survey in 2015 across all races, 57% of Americans had the opinion that the confederate flag represented southern pride rather than racism. A similar poll in 2000 had a nearly identical result. However, poll results from only the south yielded a completely different result. 75% of southern whites described the flag as a symbol of pride. Conversely, 75% of southern blacks said the flag symbolised racism. On June the 30th, 2020, Mississippi relinquished their state flag, the last US state flag to have incorporated the battle flag in its design. On November 3rd, 2020, Mississippi voters approved a new state flag without the battle flag included. So it appears that this complicated issue of history, heritage and race looks set to unravel further, and I can certainly understand both points of view on the topic. I have no right to speak on the symbols of other people, but now, at least I and others who may not realise the history of this flag can be slightly better informed when perhaps they receive that uneasy feeling when presented with the confederate symbol. On the confederate flag and his prevalent use, Michael P.S. Hayes on the Ric Flair podcast said, You know, when we came to Texas, the Von Erichs would proudly um, take a flag from a fan of the audience and the Texas flag with the Lone Star and, and all that. So being the, you know, the nemesis in the uh, storyline, then we started taking the Georgia flag, which had the rebel flag in it, which I've always thought, just from a flag perspective, was a gorgeous flag. And so then we started making our outfits out of the rebel flags because, uh, hello, we're rebellious. <laughs> Never had anything to do with being racist. You know, then people like to say, well, they painted their faces like a rebel flag. Okay, if you look at history, the first and only time that we ever started painting our faces was when we were going against the road warriors, yeah. who also painted their faces and were notoriously known for being from the north. Um, so people read so much more into that. Man, I, I just don't think clothes and, and images make bad people. I think bad people are bad people. Michael P.S. Hayes, when acting as head writer of WWE in 2008, attended a WrestleMania after party where after a drunken dispute with world's strongest man Mark Henry said this, something which Henry took great offence to and reported Michael Hayes to WWE HR. 
who quickly removed the head writer from his position and stripped him of his privileges as a producer and vice president within the company. I agree with Michael Hayes on that one thing. Bad people are bad people. Racists are bad people. Those who abuse their powers over others are bad people. Michael Hayes is bad people. As of today, I'd like to officially announce that I quit fucking WWE. I am no longer employee. I refuse to work for races. After making his name as ACH on the Indies in the United States and Mexico, the man behind the character, Albert Christian Hardy, was signed to WWE with their developmental brand under the new name of Jordan Miles. Full of potential, WWE and the creative team behind NXT wanted to begin to market their hot new signing almost immediately. One huge part of any wrestler's marketing plan and steady stream of revenue is from merchandise sales. Thus, WWE and ACH began to work on a design for a t-shirt. In a selection of tweets, Jordan Miles tagged his ex-bosses Vince McMahon and Triple H, calling the designs racist. He said, I will keep posting this till my voice is heard. I'm not sorry for anything I say or do. Representation is important. If this is Vince McMahon and Triple H's vision of me, then this is a slap in the face to every African-American performer, fan and supporter. WWE then reported, Albert Hardy Jr. aka Jordan Miles approved this t-shirt for sale. As always, we work collaboratively with all of our performers to develop logos and merchandise designs and get their input and approval before proceeding. This was the same process with Albert, and we responded swiftly once he later requested that the logo on t-shirt be redesigned. No t-shirts were sold. I only agreed to the shirt because it was shown to me on a white tee. Once placed on a black tee, you can clearly see the racist intentions. Baker Landon lied to my face. He said Triple H wanted this design, so my hands were tied. I spoke with Triple H in person and his impression was I approved. Dave Meltzer believes ACH could have handled the situation differently. He certainly hasn't shown himself in a great light with what he said about Jay Lethal. I don't know if he had played his cards better. I mean, there's a lot of people in WWE who are very angry at him right now and understandably so. I fucking quit. Fuck them. I hate that fucking company and everything they fucking stand for. All they did was ever hold our fucking people back. I do this shit for the culture. I don't need anyone's fucking permission to do what I want to do. Screw Jordan Miles. Don't ever call me by that slave name. Call me ACH and don't forget the super bitch. I quit. Fuck you. And we need to go back and teach both sides of history. And until we do that and educate the entire human race, this thing will not stop. When in April of 2012, Hulk Hogan was embroiled in a scandal after the release of a private and illegal video recorded of him and distributed online. It's disgusting because it's such a violation of privacy and it's disgusting because Hulk Hogan's old and gross. I mean, come on, look at this man. It is terrible that anyone could ever secretly film someone in any circumstance, but during an intimate and private moment of lovemaking is deplorable. The woman in the video was Heather Clem, who was the wife of Hogan's long-term friend, Bubba the Love Sponge. But seemingly, Bubba was in on the action. He can be heard on the video, which, which he secretly recorded, saying, You two can do your thing. Now, I have no right to pass judgement on a man who likes to be cuckolded by a monster like Hulk Hogan and his 24-inch pythons, but that isn't why we're here. Worst of all, in the secret video, Hogan used racial terms to describe his daughter's then-black boyfriend that were as offensive as they were ignorant and have no place in a civilised society.
Hogan showed in a moment where he thought he was away from the public eye, a moment where he could truly be himself, that he was in fact probably a racist. A man who created a character who would inspire millions of children around the world to be better and realise their dreams. His theme song even tells us that Hogan wants to fight for the rights of every man. But I guess every man doesn't include black men in Hulk Hogan's mind. With his public image on the line, in October of 2012, Hogan had to act fast and recover some of the respect he had lost due to his now public racist outpouring. So you'd think that he would go on a charm offensive, use that charisma to swing favour back his way, and spend his days split between attempting to right his obvious wrongdoings to the black community and begging for forgiveness from the wrestling fans who he had so deeply offended. Completely humiliated. I was just so desperate, I went over there, one thing led to another, I just let my guard down. But no, Hogan filed a lawsuit against Bubba the Love Sponge and his wife Heather Clem, alleging invasion of privacy, negligent and intentional infliction of emotional harm, and quickly settled out of court following a public apology from the pair. Privacy suit against Gawker, which claimed among its many defenses that the publishing of the video is protected by the First Amendment. Turning his attention towards the company which had made the video in which Hogan made his racism known public for the world to see, he then successfully sued Gawker for defamation, loss of privacy, and emotional pain in a lawsuit where he claimed a hundred million dollars and settled out of court for 30 million in damages. Just give us something, Hulk. This morning, an absolute victory for Hulk Hogan in his invasion of privacy battle for posting a secretly recorded tape of Hogan. And the hack pseudo-journalism company folded on March the 18th of 2016. Around this time, Hogan spoke to Howard Stern and said on his radio show, It was a bad choice and a very low point. I was with some friends and made a wrong choice. It has devastated me. I have never been this hurt. It's been a surreal trial from the start, to say the least. It made me a little bit sick. Hulk Hogan's ex-wife, Linda, I, I is speaking out about the staggering $115 million award the wrestling legend just won. I don't know how he can sleep at night knowing that he's got the money for doing what he did. A quote which I feel perfectly sums up the selfishness of Hogan. His first thoughts are seemingly always about how the situation affected him. Yes, I agree that it is disgusting to secretly record someone, no matter what the circumstances. Yes, I think Hogan is well within his rights to feel betrayed and hurt by what was his close friend. And I agree that he should have tackled Gorka with the full force of the law on his side. Gawker Media founder Nick Denton. About the middle of the trial, I walk in the men's room and it's me and Nick Denton by ourselves. <clears throat> if this was... WrestleMania, he was in the ring with me. It was just me and him. Wouldn't it be fun? But what about those black people that are huge Hulk Hogan fans? Some in their 50s and 60s enjoyed Hogan back in his heyday at WrestleMania 3 and followed his career for over 40 years. How does Hogan think his horrid comments made them feel? How does Hogan think it would feel to have someone who you looked up to and admired, supported and cheered for, turn out to hate a part of you which you have no control over? What about the African-American wrestlers that have shared the ring and locker room with Hogan since the 70s? How does he think this news made them feel? Since the incident occurred, many black wrestlers have spoken out about the situation and given an insight into the matter. Titus O'Neil explained, This is not about a second or third chance. This is about a man making a decision to make statements that he truly felt in his heart, I believe, at that time. He may not feel that way now, he may regret it, but to come out and say, I didn't know I was being recorded, and be careful what you say, and I don't remember saying that stuff, when you start out an apology like that, dude, you already lost it. In 2015, WWE cut ties with Hogan when the public backlash grew too large. Years of glory, followed by years of terrible publicity, led to a time where the company and the immortal one parted ways. WWE removed Hogan from planned promotional dates and from certain areas of their website. Fans were divided about how such a legend should be treated. A statement from WWE read, 
WWE terminated its contract with Terry Bollea, aka Hulk Hogan. WWE is committed to embracing and celebrating individuals from all backgrounds as demonstrated by the diversity of our employees, performers and fans worldwide. Hogan was removed from the WWE Hall of Fame and stepped back from his on-screen appearances with the company, making his way onto new channels and chat shows in order to air his grievances and attempt to make amends. A few years passed, and then WWE said, After a three-year suspension, Hulk Hogan has been reinstated into the WWE Hall of Fame. This second chance follows Hogan's numerous public apologies and volunteering work with young people, where he is helping them learn from his mistakes. This led to Hogan being invited backstage to apologise face-to-face to the wrestlers in WWE. Hogan said, I said those words. It was totally unacceptable and I just really wanted to get in front of all the talent and apologise because I know I hurt this business and I just want to move forward. Things didn't go exactly to Hulk's plan however as many of the performers in the locker room felt that Hogan's apology only further strengthened the idea that he was sorry that he got caught rather than being genuinely sorry for his hurtful and racist remarks. There were very mixed feelings with many not believing he was sincere, reported Dave Meltzer in the Wrestling Observer newsletter. Unfortunately, I must echo the sentiment and dissatisfaction expressed by many of my fellow contemporaries concerning Mr. Belea's apology and its lack of true contrition, remorse and a desire to change, tweeted Titus O'Neill, who was in the locker room to witness Hogan's apology. Hogan said, I just hope the Brotherhood can get back to the way it was. Outside the ring, you're supposed to protect your brother. In this case, it's a situation where 75, 80, 90% of the wrestlers are protecting me and they're giving me another chance to move forward. There's just a few wrestlers that kind of like don't understand the bond and the Brotherhood of Wrestling. If someone makes a mistake, you need to forgive them and move on and try to let them prove themselves. He seems as if he is not truly willing to take responsibility for what he said or how he thought about black people, rather pushing the blame onto those who don't accept his apology or subscribe to the idea that he simply used the words rather than being a racist. Since his reinstatement by WWE, Hulk made his return at a Saudi Arabia show, which considering all of the controversy surrounding WWE's involvement in this part of the world, seemed fitting. At the show, Hogan said nothing of real importance, hyped the crowd and ignored the giant elephant in the room. He has since gone on to introduce WrestleMania, opening the two-night event alongside Titus O'Neil in what at best feels like an attempt to show how much he has changed, and at worst, looks like WWE attempting to garner fan support for Hogan whilst using O'Neil as a pawn. Regardless, a loud group of fans who were present at the show seemingly didn't appreciate the gesture and booed Hogan throughout both segments, showing that even if WWE and Hulk want to leave his racist comments in the past, some fans will not be so quick to move on. If we could take a look at the at the camel's hooves. It was 1991, and at the time, The US and Iraq were in the midst of the Gulf War and tensions were extremely high between the two nations. The WWF once again proved that they weren't above using any sensitive topic in order to draw a crowd, having turned their returning all-American hero Sergeant Slaughter into a Yankee-hating Iraqi sympathizer and dedicated follower of the Iraq leader Saddam Hussein. They placed Slaughter as the leader of a newly formed group known as the Triangle of Terror with General Adnan and eventually the Iron Sheik as Colonel Mustafa. The hatred that these three men received when appearing at shows meant that anyone who faced off against them instantly had the support of the American audience. After winning the 1991 Royal Rumble, Hogan headed backstage where he was interviewed by Gene Okerlund. During the segment, News was brought to Hulk's attention that the new WWF champion Sergeant Slaughter and General Adnan were celebrating their defeat of the Ultimate Warrior by destroying Hulk's beloved American flag. 
This sent Hogan into a patriotic rage where he promised to defeat Slaughter at WrestleMania for the WWF title and for the honour of the American people. Before the event, Hulk promised fans that as soon as he had destroyed the Triangle of Terror and taken the American WWF Championship back from these evil foreigners, Iraq would concede to the US and bow out of the conflict in the Gulf. The heat of the event drew so much controversy that although it was originally scheduled to take place in the 100,000 seat Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, the stadium was deemed too large to protect from any potential backlash it may receive. WWF stated that due to a bomb threat and the inability to guarantee the fans safety, they would move the event to the nearby Los Angeles Memorial Sports Arena with its ability to hold the 16,000 crowd attendance. However, in recent years it has become evident that the reason WWF moved the show was not the security threat, but largely in part due to the poor ticket sales for the event, with an estimated 10,500 paying for a ticket to see the show, and a further 5,000 seats being filled by those with a free ticket. In the main event of WrestleMania 7, Superstars and Stripes Forever, Hogan defeated Slaughter to win the WWF Championship and celebrated with the people of America in the face of their real-life enemies, the Iraqi government. Hulk Hogan declaring himself as the reason to why the US and the coalition forces defeated Iraq and liberated Kuwait is a disgrace. It is a spit in the face to the hundreds of soldiers who have lost their lives in an attempt to restore freedom and democracy to the Middle East. It takes away from the efforts of the thousands of men and women who bravely fought for what they considered to be the right option and stood against Iraq's oppression. By the 15th of March 1991, America and the coalition forces had removed the Iraqi forces from Kuwait and handed power to a Kuwaiti democratic government. By the time WrestleMania 7 took place nine days later, the whole war was already at an end. I can appreciate that Hogan's character is and always was as patriotic as it's possible to be. I understand the idea that his confidence in the US's victory in the Middle East was probably reassuring to small children watching at the time, heck, even some adults too, but there is something so dark and twisted in the idea that a simple, meaningless pro wrestling show would attempt to ramp up the emotion of an event which wasn't selling well by using the real life deaths of an ongoing war. At the time, it, it was serious. I mean, we were, what was this, 2004? We were just a few years really removed from um, 9 11. Seemingly, the WWE had loved the success of the Iraqi sympathizer and the heat which it drew from the fans. So, as tensions began to rise once again between the USA, Afghanistan and Iraq following the devastating attacks on 9-11, the creative team behind the scenes leapt at the chance to recreate that same heat. They turned Mark Julian Copani, an Italian-American wrestler, into the Jordanian-Palestinian Muhammad Hassan, a character who was born out of the hatred showed by many Americans towards those of Arabic descent. People around the world were scared following the terror of September 2001, confused and conflicted over the USA's response in the Middle East. In the weeks from September the 11th, 645 hate crimes and aggravated harassment took place against anyone in the US who was thought to have even vaguely been of Middle Eastern origin. Muslims and South Asians were primarily targets of vandalism, threats, assault, arson and shootings as Americans looked to seek revenge for what had happened. Several mosques were attacked and a Hindu temple was burnt down via a revenge bombing in the US. Sikhs were targeted by those who mistook their traditional turbans as a sign of their Islamic faith with one Balbir Singh Sodi being fatally shot in Arizona. The Islamic Society of North America put out a statement saying, We call upon Muslim Americans to come forward with their skills and resources to help alleviate the suffering of the affected people and their families. But this did little to quash the tensions in the US at the time, thus many of those who were perceived to be Muslim or Middle Eastern felt scared to simply go about their daily lives. This fear is what initially sparked the idea of the wrestling character Muhammad Hassan. 
In December of 2004, dressed in traditional robes and a Middle Eastern headwear, Hassan came to the ring talking to the crowd about the discrimination he had received at the hands of Americans, simply on the basis of his race. With the world in the state that it was, this simply fanned the flames and drew crowds to hate his character even further, realising that WWE had a character which would be perfect to face off against their all-American patriotic performers. The storyline skewed away from Hassan as a sympathetic man and leaned heavily into the idea that he stood against American values and denounced the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. The character proved successful right away. For such a new performer, Hassan was allowed a chance to make his name against some of the biggest face characters that the ruthless aggression era had to offer. Hassan faced off against Jerry Lawler, Sergeant Slaughter, Hulk Hogan and Shawn Michaels, all the while continuing to complain to the WWE fans that he was held back due to his Middle Eastern heritage. When Hassan appeared at the Royal Rumble, the entire match pulled to a stop as the wrestlers in the ring awaited his entrance. As soon as Hassan stepped between the ropes, the performers took turns attacking him before teaming up to quickly throw him back out of the match. Initially, Hassan and his manager Davari would pray to Allah whilst making their entrance in matches and thank him during their victories whilst raising their hands to the sky. All the while, Davari would repeat Hassan's promos in Persian, something which would always be hated by American wrestling audiences. This drew backlash from Islamic groups and the verbal praying had to stop. But this wouldn't be the most controversial aspect of the Muhammad Hassan character, not by a long shot. On July the 4th, 2005, Hassan faced off against The Undertaker on a taping of SmackDown. After Hassan was defeated, he began to pray on the entrance ramp with The Undertaker still in the ring. Then from the back appeared five masked men, dressed in black and camo, who made their way to the ring and attacked The Undertaker with clubs. As the dead man fell, one of the ski masks sporting assailants pulled out a wire and began to choke him to within an inch of his life. This allowed Hassan to step in and place the fallen undertaker in the camel clutch submission, creating an unprecedented rally of support from the fans for the undertaker and an insane amount of hatred aimed towards what now looked like a terrorist organisation standing in the ring. The show aired three days later on the 7th of July, and in a manner which nobody could have possibly predicted. Reports are just coming in of an explosion at Liverpool Street Station here in London. One carriage completely wiped out, at least nine people very seriously injured and trapped, two confirmed fatalities. The same day, a terrorist attack occurred in London, England, and the themes of the show were too similar for some fans to bear. UPN, the network which aired SmackDown, received huge swathes of complaints from international audiences and immediately forced the WWE to remove the Muhammad Hassan character from their programming. On pay-per-view, where the company had a bit more freedom, at the Great American Bash on July the 24th, The Undertaker effectively deleted the Hassan character by sending him plummeting off the entranceway onto the concrete floor below with a wicked powerbomb. This was followed by an announcement from Teddy Long who explained that Hassan had suffered career-ending injuries and would no longer be appearing on the show. Mark Julian Copani, the man behind the character, was then sent back to WWE Developmental with the idea to repackage him and reintroduce him as a completely different person. However, due to the backlash he received following the incident, Kapani stepped away from his role in the professional wrestling industry as a whole, only to wrestle a handful of matches for other promotions over the next 15 years. It's a terrible situation for all involved. The fans are upset because they use pro wrestling as a means of escapism to get away from the real-life horrors and were right to feel pain surrounding the attacks in London. It was a bad look for WWE, especially in front of their advertisers and television networks, who didn't want to be associated with such negativity. There's no way WWE could have known how things would play out, but I guess that's a risk you take when you attempt to mould storylines and characters so closely around real-world controversies. But most of all, it's unfortunate for Kapani, who 
who was following the orders of the creative team within WWE and was given the character to try and do his best with. Could he have said no? Yeah, but he would have risked tarnishing his entire career within the company. How ironic then, that a man who was touted to one day become the youngest world heavyweight champion in WWE's history saw his entire wrestling journey come to a crashing end because of his decision to take on the role. The topic of racism and its effect on a society and an individual are much studied and documented, so instead of attempting to explain the effects of racism through my narrow window onto the world, I read several academic studies which attempted to scientifically understand why racism is such a bad thing for humanity as a whole and how it affects those who are targeted in deep and profound ways. Ethnic minority people, when compared to white British people, are more likely to report adverse, harsh or distressing mental health experiences and poor outcomes if they develop a mental illness and are in contact with services. They experience, their exp these experiences are persistent and driven by societal disadvantage, framed by institutional and interpersonal racism. Racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. Racism is a social detriment of health that has a profound impact on the health status of children, adolescents, emerging adults and their families. Although progress has been made towards racial equality and equity, the evidence to support the continued negative impact of racism on health and well-being through implicit and explicit biases, institutional structures and interpersonal relationships is clear. Failure to address racism will continue to undermine health equity for all children, adolescents, emerging adults and their families. I thought my name was Spick until I was about 13. And that was my first uh, awareness that uh, race was an issue. Anti-immigration sentiments fuel the proliferation and stereotypical depictions of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans. Although most Mexican-Americans are at least partially descended from indigenous peoples and Mexican-Americans have been in the United States for many generations, they are often seen and portrayed as newly arrived cultural parasites. The stereotypical depiction of Mexicans, especially those thought to be in the United States illegally, are harsh and demeaning. The men are portrayed as illiterate criminals, the women are depicted as hypersexual, both men and women are portrayed as lazy, dirty, physically unattractive menaces. Mexicans use the Spanish fly, a Mexican surfboard, and are almost entirely high-flying masked luchadors. These stereotypes were used in order to create a storyline within WWE where the loudmouthed Texan John Bradshaw Layfield went out into the night close to the Mexican border and chased off anyone trying to cross into America. In his very first appearance after splitting with Farouk and changing his character drastically to JBL, he proclaimed, you go back to Mexico and tell your Mexican family they'd better stay there. When he faced off against Eddie Guerrero, JBL's core motivations came from the idea that he was racist against immigrants. In recent years, when the real-life John Bradshaw Layfield had been questioned about the character, he has always responded with gusto, defending the decision to play such a controversial figure. When asked about the incident on Twitter, JBL replied, Karen said what? Sorry, your feelings are hurt by a fictional character, Snowflake. Please immediately cancel your account and report to the nearest adult to find a safe place. And I remember telling a kid one time, I was like, let me tell you, the Ku Klux Klan comes here and they see your last name, you're going too, bro. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and the kids are like, what are you talking about? And it was like a big thing. Lucha Libre had a face, if ever Lucha Libre had a heart and a soul, it's this man right here, known around the world, Rey Mysterio is finally home here in Lucha Underground! Hey. 
you have been in many places. When Lucha Underground revealed the signing of Rey Mysterio Jr. was when me and other fans started to believe that the brand had a real chance at mainstream success. In the States and Europe, there's arguably no bigger name in the whole world of pro wrestling under a mask. A man who has consistently been one of the most popular wrestlers wherever he's appeared in the ring, from WCW to the independent Mexican wrestling scene, there's no doubt that Rey Mysterio is a megastar, and he has the merch sales to prove it. Since his time in Lucha Underground, Rey Mysterio has been performing in WWE once again, with his shortened name teaming with his son Dominic. Doing my part in the entertainment world to be able to be a distraction, whether for a second or forever for my people, it's a blessing to be able to do that, Rey Mysterio said. It's very hard to have everyone tuned in to the same state of mind, where we all get equal opportunities and we all get equal love from each and every race that is out there. Unfortunately, some people do not think that way. My name is Alberto, El Patron, but of course you already knew that. Alberto Del Rio has a very complex history with WWE, with his journey thus far within the company being that of a hero to a zero. His contract was terminated after he became physical with a producer. This incident occurred allegedly because of a racist joke made backstage. An undisclosed source said, Based on sketchy stories and what wrestlers have been talking about at catering, somebody asked a web producer to clean off his plate. The person joked something along the lines of how that's Del Rio's job. Del Rio found out and confronted him. As the story goes, the producer didn't apologise and then smiled at him and Del Rio slapped him. Since then, Alberto El Patron has been involved in numerous scandalous activities over the last five years. Cocaine addiction, domestic abuse and a litany of other shady dealings have turned this once WWE champion and one of Mexico's biggest stars into a shadow of his former self. Recently, he teased a return to WWE, which most of us hope does not happen. Tetsuya Naito is one of New Japan Pro Wrestling's brightest stars. He was the first performer in the company to hold the IWGP Heavyweight and Intercontinental Championship simultaneously. His much beloved faction, Los Igobernables de Japón, were originally formed in Mexico. And Naito's now iconic pose, where he puts his fingers to his face and pulls open one eye, came from racism he received while wrestling for CMLL. Mexican fans in the arena would shout at Naito during his matches that he should open his eyes and make various other racist taunts towards him. This led to Tetsuya embracing the ignorance shown by the fans and using the same eye gesture shown to him by the audience and turning it back at them in defiance. A cool meaning, one which perfectly aligns with Naito's non-conformist attitude, but sadly one which reminds us that there are different forms of racism occurring around the wrestling industry to this day. Are you telling me that you are not... Yeah, I'm not a woman. White? One man who has a strong link to the Mexican community is Chavo Guerrero. legend of the industry Chavo Guerrero Jr. was held in high esteem before making his way to the Lucha Underground promotion. He has since worked on the Netflix show Glow, where he imparted his wealth of knowledge on the actors there. He is performing in AEW under his real name now, most recently managing Andrade El Idolo. He has faced racism throughout his career. However, one incident occurred back when he was wrestling with WWE, which is a little more nuanced and complicated than most others discussed in this video. There came a time when Chavo Guerrero was summoned to a meeting with the head of the company Vincent McMahon, and after being told that he was to undergo a character change, that the company would like for him to denounce his Hispanic heritage and become a white guy, known as Kerwin White. 
I was like, all right, I have two options. You either say no and possibly go back on the back burner for a while or get fired. Or you say, all right, let's do it. The Hispanics hated me because I was denouncing my Mexican heritage. I had the whites hate me because I was kind of making fun of them. I had everybody hate me and a true hill wants everybody to hate them. Now, does this offend me? No. Would it be offensive if the roles were reversed? Probably. African American? <laughs> never felt that, never heard of that, uh, never tasted that. Ketchup is a spicy, spicy food. This isn't the only generalization made against white people in pro wrestling. There are many stereotypes which some may find offensive or even racist. Good morning, Philadelphia! I'm Crazy Patty! The Irish have often been looked down upon and treated as second-class citizens throughout history, especially those who have found themselves immigrants in the United States or England. With this outdated and racist view of the Irish living on through stereotypes and characters seen on screen, it is still something which we see prevalent in the world of pro wrestling, where, in the modern day, you may not be looked down upon for being Irish and you may not end up being a heel, but you'll probably have to come to the ring to some traditional Irish folk music at some point and you'll most likely dye your hair to further emphasise your Irish roots. Killian Dane, at points in his career, would come to the ring with an attire which was a heavy nod to the Celtic free folk and, and barbarian nomadic race of the big man's Northern Irish lineage. His bright red chest and back hair, along with his thick accent, mean he has little to no choice than to play a stereotype in WWE's eyes. The self-professed ginger fella from Cabra, North Dublin, known inside WWE as the Celtic Warrior, with bright green glowing trunks. If the sparkle of his emerald attire doesn't dazzle you, then the reflection from Seamus's bright white torso surely will. Hopefully there will be a few little boys and girls watching that will go on to follow in my footsteps. Becky Lynch's footsteps, Finn Balor. So I'm excited that people at home get to see me now, Seamus said. The giant man from Ireland using the Irish curse backbreaker, the Celtic cross, both as a powerbomb and more recently used the name to refer to a slam which he had learnt from another icon of Irish wrestling. Fit Finlay, who was the second worst Irish stereotype in WWE history. And Hornswoggle, who was the worst? A literal little leprechaun, a goblin-like creature who would come springing out from under the ring apron during matches, dressed in emerald green to interfere in Finley's affairs. It was later revealed in a storyline that Hornswoggle was the true son of Vincent McMahon. When the news was announced live on air, the owner of WWE was disgusted, frustrated and disappointed to find out who his real heir was. Why? Because he's a dwarf or Irish? What is it? Becky Lynch debuted in the most stereotypical fashion imaginable for an Irish performer. Dressed in emerald green, she Irish jigged her way to the ring to some naff sounding fiddles and flutes. This is an example of how not to step away from using race as a base from a character. However, since then, Becky Lynch has left that all behind. On the main roster in WWE, she is one of the most highly decorated and well-respected wrestlers on any brand in the world. With numerous title reigns, Lynch has become beloved by fans for her charisma on the microphone and excellent in-ring ability. Yes, she still speaks with an Irish accent. That's her accent. But aside from that, her nationality plays little role in her performances on screen and she has thrived because of it. Finally... I was ready. <laughs> In WCW, a team was formed known as the West Texas Rednecks, an all-white group who regularly faced off against teams of colour, specifically feuding with the No Limit Soldiers, who featured only black and Hispanic wrestlers, with the friction between the two teams stemming from differences in race. 
A common trope for white villains in any form of media is for them to be portrayed as ignorant or racist. Pro wrestling seemingly is no different. Jack Swagger's character in WWE has proved to be controversial in some ways. What's wrong with America? Coulter then explained that he doesn't recognise America today. He said he saw people with faces not like mine and heard people that can't even talk to me. And he screamed out again to the Nashville audience and the Americans at home, where did all these people come from? The character drew so much attention that one reporter from Infowars exploded in a tirade online about the issue, saying, This is part of the divide and conquer tactic of cultural subversion to manufacture racial division and to characterize the Tea Party, conservatives, libertarians, opponents of uncontrolled illegal immigration as racists, extremist radicals who should be pushed to the fringes of the political discourse. Now the demonization runs so deep that it's even being bolstered by WWE wrestling. The fact that WWE is owned by Vince and Linda McMahon, who are a part of the Republic establishment, also tells us a lot about how grassroots conservatives and libertarians are viewed by those near the top of the power structure. Another key difference, especially in the modern day, is the audience's sensitivity towards what they are enjoying as entertainment and their desire for escapism. Imagine you are Jewish and you have the horrendous mental scars of knowing that in the not-so-distant past, your family members were caught up in the unthinkable acts which took place at the hands of the Nazis. You attend a local wrestling show and your favourite wrestler is facing off against a character who is portraying a fascist. Now, instead of enjoying your simple slice of slamming action, you are sad and thinking about the real-life events that occurred. The same could be said for someone who has lost a loved one to a terrorist attack. Do they really want to have to relive those memories while Mohammed Hussam parades around the ring, calling your entire way of life disgusting? What about for black people in the audience? You see a man dressed up in a KKK hood. How does that make you feel? Disney's streaming service includes a 12-second disclaimer that cannot be skipped before films like Dumbo and Peter Pan that tells viewers that they will see negative depictions and mainstream mistreatments of people of culture. These stereotypes were wrong then and they are wrong now, the disclaimer warns. Rather than remove this content, we want to acknowledge its harmful impact learn from it and spark conversation to create a more inclusive future together. NBC Universal said that Peacock was reviewing WWE content to ensure it aligns with Peacock's standards and practices as it does other shows and films on its platform. This has led to countless sections being held back when WWE's content was being transitioned onto the Peacock service, something which many fans online have been vocal about. Peacock and WWE are reviewing all past content to ensure it fits our 2021 standards, WWE said. Do you think that WWE should continue to remove hateful or racist moments from their libraries, hidden away as not to perpetuate the racism and bring ill feelings to future generations, or keep them as a reminder that they happened and hopefully a moment to learn from the mistakes of our past? We live in a time where hatred is stoked at the highest level. Fascism and racism cannot win, and if you're struggling to come up with a way that you can help, the easiest way to help is to combat that intolerance with intolerance. There's no room for it. In AEW, there is a shocking lack of diversity at the top of the card, perhaps not a result of racism on the part of its mixed-race owner, but things could certainly be better. Tony Khan recently spoke on the topic when he said, I think we are going to see some wrestlers of colour in the men's division. I think it's something that's really important to me. We have some wrestlers who are absolutely going to contend. I don't want to tip my hand on who will be in contention, but I think you'll see by the end of the year that I am committed to diversity and I'm doing some exciting things to establish new stars, both in the singles and tag division, and getting some diversity into these roles. You'll see, and I'm going to do it in a way that you won't remember we had this conversation, and it's going to be good. 
We are the outcasts. And we all have different styles. We could be the wrestlers that we want to be. With the dominance of the Bullet Club in New Japan Wrestling, there has been a noticeable shift in the company in its attitude towards gaijin or foreign performers. Kenny Omega, Jay White, Finn Balor, Jeff Cobb, Chris Jericho, John Moxley, Juice Robinson, The Young Bucks, Zack Sabre Jr., Jay Lethal and Will Ospreay all making huge leaps forward for how mixing up New Japan's roster with more non-Japanese wrestlers can have a positive impact and the fans have witnessed a resurgence for the company over the last decade because of it. WWE spokesman Brian Flynn said, WWE has a long history of creating fictional characters that serve as either protagonists or antagonists, no different than other television shows or feature films. To create compelling and relevant content for an audience, it is important to incorporate current events into our storylines. WWE is creating drama centred on a topical subject that has varying points of view to develop a rivalry between two characters. WWE is committed to embracing and celebrating individuals from all backgrounds as demonstrated by the diversity of our employees, performers and fans worldwide. In recent years, WWE has embraced its multicultural roster and allowed their performers' personalities to shine through, far beyond simply being a racial stereotype. Kofi Kingston overcame his badly executed Jamaican accent and one-note character which he arrived with on the roster to ascend through a gospel choir gimmick and eventually to just being himself, something which allowed his true charisma and personality to shine and reconnect with the WWE fans on his way to a historic WrestleMania victory and a reign as the WWE Champion. His allies in the New Day have also stepped beyond their stereotypes and become some of the most popular entertainers in the entire wrestling industry. Through the course of our lives, people have used racist comments towards us and it doesn't feel good, Kofi Kingston said. But if we stopped moving forward every time we were met with prejudicial hatred, then we would never have achieved our current accomplishments. Xavier Woods somehow manages to run a successful video game YouTube channel while performing to a high enough level within the squared circle to be named 2021's King of the Ring. Whilst Big E has gone from powerlifting brute through some of the wittiest promos in recent memory to become a deserved WWE champion. None of these instances put race first. Of course, it is important to recognise that these three wrestlers come from an African-American background. All three of these men of colour should be proud of their various heritages and the paths that led them to the biggest stage in WWE. But that wasn't what made them successful. What it took for these men to stand out was charisma, hard work and dedication, all of which they have in bundles and none of which is restricted in any way by the colour of their skin. You see the brown skin, you see the name and you go, ah, because of this, that means you're a barbarian, you're uncivilized. you want to wish harm upon everybody. And you say all of these terrible things about me. Now, if I respond and yell horrific things at you and I insult you, I've kind of proved your point. But if I respond in kindness and I clarify you and I sound intelligent and articulate, not only have I defeated your point, I've made you look like an idiot. Yeah? Here and there, someone deserves a clap back and they'll get it. My whole thing is, I know what you're saying is not true, so why would I let that interrupt me? My dream? No, my purpose remains the same. I will be the first ever Japanese WWE World Heavyweight Champion. The Royal Rumble is only one path on my journey. I will find another way to climb the mountain. My journey is not finished. Life goes on. And now, in the modern day, it feels as if WWE can truly call themselves diverse. Perhaps at the expense of other pro wrestling companies around the world, WWE over the last few years has been on a relentless financial splurge, hurriedly signing any and all hot properties on the independent scene and just as quickly ending their contracts. 
The positivities from the, the positive from this is that they've been able to cultivate a roster which organically allows wrestlers of all races and nationalities an attempt to make a name for themselves. And I hope that the pattern from the largest earning promotion in the industry can continues on as the new normal for what pro wrestling was built to be and should continue to be something which is accessible to everyone. Personally, I see the issue stemming on from mass generalisation and the need to fit millions of people into brackets, frameworks of hatred that allow fans to cheer the all-American superhero and reject the ideas of those from other countries, the wrestling industry's historic reliance on good versus evil, the need for the fans to support a babyface and buy tickets to see them, while banding together to oppose the evil heels and pay money to hopefully see them get beaten. This constant propagation of black versus white with no area for grey, no nuance, no second guessing or change. USA versus the world is one of the most overdone and egregiously misused tropes in all of sports entertainment. And as the fans become ever smarter, even more connected by the internet, we've seen a dramatic shift in the audience's response to this overtrodden tribe during the last 20 years. And entertainment, especially WWE, needs to keep up. The company has one of the world's most successful online presences. It gets millions of views on most everything they post to their several very well followed social media platforms, connected with hundreds of millions around the globe. But still, somehow, they have to let this slip and never got ridden of something as outdated as an idea as the Cold War itself. Imagine Manchester United fans booing Paul Pogba because he's French. Imagine if the Spurs basketball fans had shunned Tim Duncan, arguably the best foreign player to ever throw a ball in the NBA, and they hadn't gone on to make him captain and to win five titles. Centre Court of Wimbledon and the match is a disaster as Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer battle it out in the final, showered in litter, abuse hurled at both men on every swing of the racket because they aren't British. Sports have moved on, most importantly the world's moved on. We are different now as a culture within our communities where race and nationality, especially where I live in a city like Bristol, are becoming more vague and blurred, at the same time becoming more accepted than it's ever been, we are more proud of our mixed heritage and are realising the wonder and beauty of learning from one another and collaborating for a brighter world together. Let me choose my favourite wrestler, let me boo who I want to boo and cheer who I want to cheer. I don't dislike Roman Reigns because he's Samoan or American. I just like Roman because of his personality, his charisma and general aura which comes from within him and has nothing to do with his heritage or race. In fact, that's one of the massive positives in my eyes for Reigns. His illustrious family tree plays so nicely into his character. His cousins, his uncles, his brothers, all legends that have laid the gauntlet for him to try and beat. I don't hate the great Carl Lee's in-ring character because he's Indian or Asian, nor because he's a vegan. I respect the ability to get so fucking jacked on a restricted diet. I bet he eats a shit ton of delicious food every day. His body must be so pure. My body shakes when he comes on the television and my hand spontaneously reaches for the controller. That failing, my legs autonomously walk me out of sight of the screen as my stomach sinks. But not in any way because of his nationality, but because he's shit at wrestling and has tiny, tiny shins. Oh, <laughs>